Mr. Rajan called down yesterday and just gave some amazing news. The church in Kathmandu is bursting at the seams. They don't have place for meeting. And they may have to go to two services now, back to back. And that's really exciting. Uh, Orissa, they, uh, in Orissa we've got nine, seven or nine churches. And Pastor Pradeep took a group of 16 people uh, last week, a couple of weeks ago, and they baptized them before us. Tremendous. In Gujarat, just amazing things are happening in Gujarat, and uh, it's just incredible what's going on all around. So praise the Lord, huh? Really great. Let's stand. <coughs> Anush and Caroline, we're going to miss you, and uh, we'll see you back soon. So, uh, Sam, it's great to see you again. Let's, let's return to 1 Kings chapter 16 at the end. I'm going to do a little bit of a longish reading, maybe 27 verses, but it's, uh, it's good. It's just a good, good chapter to look at, okay? And uh, we'll maybe do a, like a two-part series on, on Elijah, and I want you to look at this carefully. We'll start reading from uh, 1 Kings chapter 16, verse 29. We come across a man called Ahab, who's the king of Israel at the time when Elijah comes on the scene. And we'll hear a little bit about him. Now Ahab, verse 29, the son of Omri became king over Israel in the 38th year of Asa, the king of Judah. And Ahab reigned over Israel in Samaria for 22 years. Verse 30 tells us a little bit about Ahab, this Jewish man and his character. It says, the son of Omri, Ahab, did evil in the sight of the Lord more than all the kings who were before him. And it came about, verse 31, as though it had been a trivial thing for him to walk in the sins of Jeroboam, the son of Nebat, that he married Jezebel, the daughter of Ethbal, king of the Sidonians. And Ahab went to serve Baal and worship him. It's amazing, a Jewish king was worshiping a pagan god right in Israel. So he erected an altar for Baal in the house of Baal, which he built in Samaria. And Ahab also made Asherah. Thus Ahab did more to provoke the Lord of God of Israel than all the kings of Israel who were before him. Enter the prophet Elijah. 17 verse 1. Now Elijah the Tishbite, he was somewhere from Santa Cruz. <laughs> somewhere right there. I don't know where, but if you look around, there's places there. Who was of the settlers of Gilead said to Ahab, As the Lord, the God of Israel lives, before whom I stand, he comes into Ahab's palace and makes this pronouncement. Surely there will be neither dew nor rain these years except by my words. And after he makes the pronouncement, the word of the Lord comes to him, saying, Go away, Elijah, from here, and turn eastward, and hide yourself by the brook Cherit, which is east of the Jordan. And it shall be that you shall drink of the brook, and I have commanded the ravens to provide for you there. Read crows. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord, for he went and lived by the brook Cherith, which is east of the Jordan. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning and bread and meat in the evening. And he would drink of the brook. And it happened after a while that the brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. Then the word of the Lord came to him again, saying, Arise and go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I have commanded a widow there to provide for you. Jesus spoke about this widow, a Gentile widow, who was a worshiper of Yahweh in apostate, backslidden Israel. So he rose and went to Zarephath. When he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please give me a little water in a jar that I may drink. And she was going to, going to get it. And he called her and said, Please, 
Bring me a piece of bread in your hand. But she said, As the Lord your God, Yahweh, lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour in the bowl and a little oil in the jar. And behold, I'm gathering a few sticks that I may go in and prepare for me and my son that we may eat and die together. She was a little discouraged. She was a little depressed. But Elijah said to her, Do not do that. Do not fear. Go do as you've said, but make me a little bread cake from it first and bring it out to me. And afterwards you will to make one for yourself and for your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, The bowl of flour shall not be exhausted, nor shall the jar of oil be empty, until the day the Lord sends rain on the face of the earth. And so she went and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and her household ate for many days. In verse 16, The bowl of flour was not exhausted, nor did the jar of oil become empty, according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke through Elijah. And it came about after these things, the son of the woman, the mistress of the house, became sick. And his, and his sickness was so severe, there was no breath left in the son. So she said to Elijah, what do you have to do with, what do I have to do with you, O man of God? You've come to bring me iniquity to remembrance and to put my son to death. And he said to her, give me your son. And he took him from her bosom and carried him to the upper room where he was living and laid him on his bed. And he called to the Lord and he said, O oh Lord, my God, have you also brought calamity to the widow with whom I'm staying by causing her son to die? Then he stretched himself upon the child three times and called to the Lord and said, O oh Lord, my God, I pray you, let this life, child's life return to him. Verse 22 is powerful. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah. That's beautiful. The Lord heard the voice of Elijah. The Lord heard the prayers of a man of God. And the life of the child returned to him, and he revived. And Elijah took the child and brought him down from the upper room into the house and gave him to his mother. And Elijah said, See, your son is alive. And the woman said to Elijah, Now I know that you are a man of God, and that the word of the Lord is in your mouth, and it's truth. Father, we thank you this morning. We would ask you to speak to us in our situations something that's happening in our lives today or something that could happen in our lives tomorrow we thank you today that you will want to speak to us and prepare us in our lives always bless the word today speak to us in jesus name amen I wanted you to give me, if you keep your finger on that passage today, I want to give you a very special attention this morning. As I speak a message called, When the Brook Runs Dry. When the Brook Runs Dry. And what I want to say to you is, when the brook runs dry, God is still preparing you. God is still there. He's preparing you for something bigger something better, a greater ministry when the brook runs dry. Let me give you some historical background to the story. Let me just explain this for a little bit to you so you understand why Israel at this point of time needed a man of God. And by the way, this nation needs men of God and women of God. That's on this room. There may not be a lot of women and men of God in, the, in, in India, but God needs men and women who really know Him, who stand before Him for a nation. Now, why do you think about this? The kingdom of Israel, Solomon is has died. The wise king, Israel's peak, zenith of its power and glory and wisdom is over. From Solomon downwards, the nation starts to go downhill because the nation splits into two parts. There's a civil war. There's a northern part of the nation where the where you have uh, Samaria and Nazareth and Galilee, the northern part is, becomes known as the state of Israel. The southern part where there's Bethlehem and Jerusalem is Judah. And what happens is the nation of Israel now gets a very evil king, a wicked king comes in about 875 BC. People have, the kings were no longer reading God's word. They were backslidden. And when they stopped listening to God's word and reading God's word like God said, they were not able to produce, provide leadership the nation needed. 
And so this king comes on the scene. His name is Ahab. And Ahab is a wicked king. He's an evil king. Because he's not, he's forsaken the commandments of the Lord God in the Bible. He is no longer a good ruler. He's not ruling. Think of this tonight. Ahab. And listen carefully. I want everybody to pay attention to me. Right up the back. Listen carefully. Listen carefully. Ahab is not listening to God. And Ahab does something worse that provokes God's anger. He marries a woman called Jezebel. And she is a worshiper of Baal. Not only does he do that, but Ahab now begins to follow this God called Baal. And he brings this corrupt religion of Baalism into Israel. Now, what is Baal? What is the worship of Baal? Let me explain to you. Baal was a pagan god. He was the god of the Phoenicians. And he was an idol god. And Baal was, according to the Phoenicians, he was the god who was supposed to bring to them the god they prayed to, like we have in India, gods to produce fertility of land. He was actually the god who produced rain. And they pictured Baal as sitting on a cow, very similar to India, sitting on a cow and pouring down lightning and thunder and rain upon the lands. And so the farmers would love Baal. But there was a problem with Baal worship. You see, Baal worship was very wicked. Part of Baal worship was that the people of, of the Phoenicians would have a, a god called Molech, and they would sacrifice their children to this god. And the way they would do it was very, very evil, very cruel. They would have, Molech was a god, and he was, he was made of... Uh, a big statue and he would have a big stomach and the stomach would be open and it would be a furnace in the stomach and they would take their children, babies, Baal worshippers, and they would put their babies in the stomach and heat the furnace and they thought by sacrificing their babies they would please this God. Now can you imagine that a Jewish king actually turned to the worship and brought the worship of Baalism into Israel. And God in heaven was provoked. And God in heaven needed a man. And just as God tonight in this country of our nations needs men and women who will stand for him. And God was going to bring a man. His name was Elijah. And the word Elijah actually carries the name of the living God. The word Elijah comes from three different words actually. Elohim means God. Yahweh or Jehovah. Jah. Elijah and E, I in the middle, meaning Yahweh is my God. And so when Elijah walks in the scene, his very name is saying, I'm standing for the living God tonight. I want to ask you a question tonight. In the midst of idolatry, in the midst of corruption around you, and, and all the stuff that goes on in nations, do you stand? Do you know what it means to stand for the God you love? Do you know what it means to stand as young people for the God you love and say, I'm standing for the truth. I'm standing for the living God in my life, in my college, in my schools, in my, in my business world. I'm standing. My name means Yahweh is my God. And I love the way Elijah comes to the scene. And, and by the way, we don't hear much of Elijah when he comes to the scene. It just says, Elijah the Tishbite, somewhere from Santa Cruz. <laughs> don't know where he came from. In fact, most scholars don't even know where Tishbe is. All we know is on the east side of the Jordan, and it was a little insignificant place. And you may be sitting here tonight, this morning, and you may be from a little place. You are just Alan from Berivoli, or somebody from this place, or, you know, uh, Joseph from, from this place. And we just feel like in our lives, has God got a purpose in my life? Is there something that God wants to use? And that's how Elijah came on the scene. And, and he was obviously a man who knew how to pray. He was not a fully trained man of God, but he was a man who God was in, he was in the process of training. And he comes on the scene, and I love this guy. He just comes on the scene, walks straight into Ahab's presence in his courtroom, he doesn't have any protocol. There's no, there's no yes sir, no sir, no bowing down before majesty. He comes before this, this, this very crazy king and he stands before him and says, As surely as the Lord Yahweh lives, 
there will be no more rain in this land for years except by my word. And then he walks out. <laughs> That's it. Just says that statement and walks out. I love this guy. This guy is a man of God. He is, he's somebody who just loves the Lord and he knows that he, God has spoken to him. And God says, go and give Elijah this, this message. And he was praying for, for rain and Elijah said, I want to stop the rain. This is the way we'll, we'll confront Baal. God heard his prayer. And God says, okay, Elijah, whatever you do, I'm going to use you to confront the prophets of Baal. Amazing story. Just walks out. And then, God surprises him. God gives him instructions that are very unique. You know, sometimes God surprises us. He tells us to do things that we really weren't expecting him to tell us. God tells him, Elijah, I've got some instructions for you. I want you now to go and hide yourself east of the Jordan by the brook Cherith. You mean, God, I, I, I thought my ministry was to stand and, and uh, be in the face of King Ahab. I like this, Lord. I, I like this, this ministry you gave me, to go and stand in the face of Ahab and speak to him. You made me, a, you've given me a, to be a, your spokesman. No, Elijah, I want you to go. I want you to go to the brook Cherith. I want you to go and hide yourself there. Hide myself. Yes. There were two reasons God told him to hide himself. One, he knew Ahab would be hunting for him. And he wanted to protect Elijah. But there's a deeper reason that God had him, had him at the brook, at, the, at Cherith, this place called Cherith. Unknown, little, little place out of nowhere's land. God wanted to train him up to be the man of God. He wanted to train him up to be a man of prayer, to be a man of faith, to be a man of humility. And God sometimes takes us and puts us outside the spotlight. He takes us in a place and puts us where we, maybe we don't want to be. We're going to have to learn to be very dependent on God. It was part of God's training process for us. When you go to the army, they say that the, the first thing they do to, to prepare you for the bigger battles ahead is they put you through boot camp. And boot camp is not something that's for a lot of fun. You, you, you have to hear the drill sergeant screaming at you. And one of the things that you do at boot camp is you just, you, just, you just have to follow orders all the time. Your life is not your own. And what they're basically doing, you don't understand what they're doing. They're forming you into a unit that's going to just have to trust orders and face hardship and, and crawl under barbed wire and, and be up in the nights for 24 hours and 36 hours without food. And because when you're interrogated, you will, you will not succumb to pressure. And they put you through all the situations that you will have to go through before you reach the real battles. I want you to see something today that's very important for you to see. Oftentimes when people gave names to places, the place signified something important. The place signified something important. This place, Cherith, comes from the Hebrew word Sharat. And it means to cut off or to cut down. Now listen carefully. I like that. God sent him to the place Sharat to cut him off from everything else, all entertainments, all conveniences that he could know and rely on God alone. But God also sent him to share it because God wanted to cut him down to size. God wanted to bring him to a place where God would mold this man. You see, because every one of us, without, when we come as Christians, when we come, we come from our natural lives as unsaved people. And we have talents and we have, in, we have many, many good things. And, and God has to cut us down. Oh, every one of us. He has to cut us down from our self-sufficiency and pride. Because we are very self-sufficient. And we, we just have grown up that way. And we kind of know how to do things. And we say, we often talk like this. You know, I, I'm a self-made man. Ever heard that? I'm a self-made man. 
uh, and we're self-sufficient. We like to be in control of everything in our lives. And God is to bring us to a place called Cherit to bring us down, to get us out of the spotlight, to help us to release control of our lives. It's training. And we come to this place where, where John the Baptist would come to years later when the John the Baptist would say, he must increase and I must decrease. I must move to the sidelines. It's not about me. It's all about him. A second place that God is working on us is an area of our fears. You see, oftentimes we come in and when you're a self-made person and you're really not dependent on God, these two go together. Because when everything is going right and you're in control, you know what happens? Man, you feel very confident. You see, see, this is what I accomplished. This is what I did. This is what I could do. This is because of who I am. And then when things don't go wrong, then we go the other side. And we live in our fears and we live in our circumstances. And we call what we call thermos, therm, thermometer Christians. A thermometer goes up and down with the temperature of the circumstance. But God wants to make us thermostatic Christians. A thermostat doesn't go up and down. It changes the temperature. It regulates the temperature. And when you have come to know God, and when God has become very important in your life, you don't go up and down. You're not you're unpredictable. You have somebody who regulates the temperature around you because you have a life of faith in the living God. So God is going to replace a chariot. He's going to replace your fearful life with a life of faith in Him. This is the third thing God has to reduce us from and cut us down in. And this is the need to think that we have all these rights because we all think we have rights. You know, I have a right to be treated a certain way. Don't you say that often? I have a right to a certain salary. I have a right to certain comforts that are to be given to me because I am somebody. And then you go to the army and the army says, you have no rights. You're a soldier. Paul said, Jesus forgave me. He forsook his rights to go to the cross. Paul said, don't I have a right to be married? like the other apostles? Don't I have a right to earn like the other apostles? He says, but I don't want my rights to be a hindrance to the gospel. 1 Corinthians chapter 9, verse 1 to 12. And so you see, God is bringing us to the place where we, we come to the place where we have total submission to God's plan. And chariot is the place where God, let's just say that together, where we're cut off from all our comforts and conveniences and we're, we're brought to the place where we depend totally on God and we're in a place where we're cut down to size and God is forming us because He's forming us for greater work in the future. And every single one of us will have a moments and seasons of our lives where we have a chariot experience. I'll never forget in 1989, one of my chariot experiences, and there will be others, was traveling and going in the plan of God. God sent, sent me to Baltimore, and I'll never forget that. And I'll never forget that the first six months, I was starving. I went to Baltimore all excited about Bible school, and within three months, all the money that I'd saved, all the money that I had was over. And I found myself in a place where I was totally dependent on God. My parents were not believers then. I didn't want to tap them. So I just had to live by faith. And what basically happened was two of the four dorm mates that I lived with while I was there lost their jobs for eight months and couldn't get it. So they were just about paying the bills and electricity. You've heard the story before. And all we had in the fridge when we opened the fridge was Maggie noodles. And so we ate Maggie noodles for breakfast, Maggie noodles for lunch, and Maggie noodles for dinner. And sometimes they opened the fridge and there was not even Maggie noodles. It was just bread. 
There was no eggs. There was nothing. Every morning I'd wake up and I would have to figure out how am I going to get a ride to school because I didn't have the money to take the bus. And we were foreign students. And you don't just go on the streets and t stop the BSD bus. You don't get a rickshaw. You, you, if you don't have a car, you, you, you don't, can't travel. You can't travel. And I'll never forget as a young student, I've come to Bible school, but God was teaching me beyond the classroom. He was teaching me to be totally dependent on Him. I'll never forget every night we'd have a scramble because I'd leave at different times. There was no one person to take me in. Sometimes it was 10 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes it was 11 o'clock in the morning. Sometimes it was 8 o'clock in the morning. And every night I'd have a telephone directory. And every night I'd go to the telephone directory and say, Can you take me in tomorrow? Can you take me in tomorrow? Do you know how embarrassing that was? Do you know how hard that was in one sense? And people say, You know, I'd love to take you in, but I'm going in at this time tomorrow. Pastor Melvin, you can identify? We all had to go through it. It was chariot. And you had to be dependent on the Lord. And, 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 and money had dried up. And you were just totally dependent on whatever God had for you. But we didn't realize it at that time. God was preparing us to trust Him for every day. Every day. Well, let's read a little bit here. God says, go away and hide yourself in verse 4. And I will command the ravens to provide for you there. So he went and did according to the word of the Lord. For he went and lived by the brook Cherith. And I love this, verse 6. The ravens brought him bread and meat in the morning. And bread and meat in the evening. And he would drink from the brook. Wow. Can you picture that? What a fantastic, every single morning, every single morning you had raven service. God's catering service was the ravens. And every single morning he would, they would come and they would drop, just, just picture that. They would pick up, find some bread from somewhere. And they would bring that bread to Elijah. They would go and find some meat from somewhere. But God made sure they found the meat. And they would bring that meat in their beaks. Elijah. In Mumbai, we, we, we get excited about the Mumbai's Dabawala service, right? We're very excited about it, very proud of that. Well, God had a different catering service. The ravens would come, and he would have meat and bread sandwiches in the morning, and meat and bread sandwiches in the night. Boy, it was interesting. You would say, I, I was thinking about this, you would say that every time in the evening, he was ravenously hungry. <laughs> He was just waiting for that meat to come. And God did that. And God does that. And then every morning, Elijah, listen carefully, guys. Every morning, Elijah would look for the ravens. And he would look for God's daily provision. It was his chariot experience. And he'd get on his knees. And he'd go to the brook. And he would drink the beautiful water of that beautiful brook of chariot. And he was excited about it. Because God was, God was providing. You see, every day he saw God's little provisions. There wasn't a lot, but there was enough. And then one day, God was going to take the lesson to another level. One day, Elijah looked at the brook. Man, he loved that brook. It was great water. And one day, he looked at the brook, and that brook wasn't, wasn't bubbling as, as it did before. The water wasn't flowing over the rocks as fast as it was before. He noticed the brook was kind of dwindling down a little bit. And as that was his main supply route, he looked at it very carefully. He'd go there every day and he'd watch this brook and it was just dwindling down. And, and the water kept getting less and less and less till there was only a trickle. And that trickle soon became nothing. And soon there was wet sand and soon that sand had dried up and the brook dried up. Has that happened to you? Is that part of your experience? Have you experienced that in your Christian life where God tells you to do something and you're excited and then God puts you through chariot and there he's cutting you down to size and he's bringing you to himself and then <laughs> and then you just kind of, okay, Lord, I got used to this. Okay, if it's raven meat for a little while, that's fine. And bread for a little while, that's okay. And if it's a little water, that's great, Lord. I got used to this. This is fun. I'm in Bible school. I'm in church. I'm in training. It's fun. And then all of a sudden, even that provision is taken away. And the brook dries up. And you go, Lord, what are you doing with my life? Does that happen to you? 
Oh, I know it has happened to all of us. You start a business and the business is beautiful and it's expanding and it's booming and it's, it's fantastic and the bank account is getting better and you're so excited about all these plans and then something goes wrong, the money market gets tight, the clients are not coming as you want it to, the plan starts to change a little bit, and then we see the season where the brook is flying up. You start, go to college, you're excited about what you've chosen, you're excited about the courses you've chosen, and then all of a sudden something changes as you're working on it, and things don't go according to the plan, and the brook dries up. Your company moves you to another place. You're in another land. You're far away. And you miss the church that's your home church. You say, man, I wish I could be here. The brook dried up. I know a woman in Baltimore. She used to be an amazing, amazing singer. She, when she sang, every one of us just loved it. We should sit loved her music was the voice of an angel and one day she developed cancer in the jaw beautiful precious wonderful woman just loved the lord and they had to take out operating the jaw and she could never sing the same way she did before she couldn't use a beautiful voice and god says the brook dried up i know in ministry sometimes over the seasons of times the brook dried up and you looked and you said, God, what, what is going on? And, and the first thing that happens when the brook dries up is you begin to think, God, what, what on earth are you doing? Why are you doing this? This was great. I loved the brook when it was bubbling. I, I loved everything when everything was going fantastic. Couldn't you just do that longer? Am I not living by faith? And what are you trying to do, Lord? Have you forgotten me? Have you forgotten I'm here? Lord, are you there? Don't we say that? Oh, yes, we did. You say, God, have you forgotten me? And I want to say this to you tonight. Turn with me to Isaiah 49 just for a moment. I want you to remember, when the brook dries up, God is still there. When the brook dries up, he's still alive and well. When the brook dries up, he's, he's got a second plan for you. There's something that he wants to move you to, and he's preparing you for something else. And when the brook dries up, don't throw your hands out and say, God, what are you doing? I don't believe anymore. Listen carefully today in Isaiah 43, 49. Let's read verse 14, 15, and 16. But Zion said, Zion is a beautiful picture of all the saved believers in Israel. Another word for Israel. But Zion said, the Lord has forsaken us and the Lord has forgotten me. And God replies to them back, can a woman forget her nursing child and have no compassion on the son of a womb? Is it possible for a mother to forget her child that is newborn? Is it possible? Priya, is it possible for you to forget your little baby? Is it possible? Is it possible, a Pravina, to forget the little baby? Can you forget? Is it possible? Ask an imam and they will tell you it's impossible for a mother to forget. And yet, there are some mothers that may, and they would. You hear these stories sometimes. And yet, even if that happens, God says, I will never forsake you. I'll never forget you. I'll never. Now listen to the next verse. Behold, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hand. Your walls are continually before me. God says, listen, I have inscribed you on the palms of my hand. I've written your name, believers, every one of you. Your names are on the what? Palms of my hand. And yet, you know, this is this is literally our experience sometimes. We go back and we say, man, the Lord, the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Oh, Sunday was wonderful. 
We worship the Lord. We worship the Lord. It was great worship. It was great music. The word, uh, the fellowship was fantastic. We had a tremendous conference. Great fellowship. We were fellowshipping. The prayer was beautiful. Ah, the book brook was bubbling. I was excited while I was in church. It was awesome. But then on Monday evening, I got this bad news, and the bad news got worse. And you know what? Man, I don't know. I think the Lord has forsaken me. The Lord has forgotten me. Don't we say that? We all have said that. And you know what? If God says, no, it's impossible. Can a mother forget their nursing child? Behold, I, I have inscribed you on the palm of my hand. Just, just look at the palm of your hand right now. Just each one of you, look at the palm of your hand. Now, just imagine for a moment, imagine that your hand is God's hand. And think about this. God has put your name there on His hand. You say, how can God put so many names on His hand? Because He's God. He's put a picture of you on His hand. And when you're in the brook of chariot, God is not saying, hold on a second, where did... Where did Ivy go? I don't know where Ivy is. I've misplaced Ivy somewhere. I've forgotten her. I've forgotten where Naren is. I've forgotten where, oh, you know, where, how can you forget where Naren is? He will remind you. Naren, you'll remind us, right? We go, yay, man, here I am. And he's like, okay, I know when somebody's come off the church and grabs me from the back. It's one person alone who does that. But, um, boy, isn't that amazing? God has put you on the palm of his hand. He says, you're before me, always. That's beautiful. That's beautiful. And that's one of the most important lessons that you can realize and learn. That God will never leave you. That He has not forsaken you. That He is there. That He is guiding you to the next step and the next step and the next step. By the way, do you know why God dried the brook? It was an answer to Elijah's prayer. You say, yeah, really? Yeah, Elijah prayed for the rain to stop. <laughs> Did he? He said in James 5, 7, Elijah prayed earnestly and fervently and told God, stop the rain. And God stopped the rain for three and a half years. He prayed the prayer and God answered it. And sometimes you and I pray these prayers. We pray, you know what? This is the way we pray. God, make me a godly man. God, mold me into an amazing woman of God. God, give me the faith of Pastor Shabelli. God, give me the, the fervency of Amy Carmichael. Give me this and give me that. And God says, yes, I will, but I'll have to send you to Brook Cherith. And while you're there, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to make sure the ravens get you, uh, feed you. And while you're there, I'm going to replace your self-sufficiency and your pride. I'm going to replace it with, with, with humility and dependence on me every day. I'm going to give you Maggie noodles. And I'm going to give you raven bread. And I'm going to just give you what you need. And then I'm going to replace that. I'm going to take away your rights until you understand that all you have is full submission to me. And you can never be offended with anything that I do because a servant of God has no rights. I'm going to take your fears and I'm going to make you a man of faith. And I'm going to do all of that because I'm going to answer your prayers. And at the end of it, you are going to become a man and a woman of God. Wow. Praise the Lord. At the place of Cherith, we're cut down. And then look at what happens. I want to remind you that all through Brook, when the brook dried, God was still there. He was alive. He was there. He was speaking. What is the only thing you need to know when, you, when the brook runs dry? That God is on the throne and I need to listen to his next instructions. Because there's nothing else that you need. Look at what happens in the next verse. God speaks in at the brook cherry. When the brook runs dry, listen to the next part. Verse 7 says, And it happened after a while. The brook dried up because there was no rain in the land. But verse 8. Then the word of the Lord came to Elijah, saying, Arise and go to Zarephath. The word of the Lord came. 
We don't know how long it took between the brook drying up, some weeks, some days, some months, when the brook dries up and God is speaking, giving you new instructions, but this is what God had. God was alive. He was speaking to Elijah. He says, go, Elijah, I want you to go to Zarephath. I've got new instructions for you. I've got advanced training for you. I'm preparing you for something important. And it happened. And the word came, arise, go to Zarephath, which belongs to Sidon, and stay there. Behold, I've commanded a widow there to provide for you. Wow. So he arose and went to Zarephath. That's it. You just do what God tells you to do in your situation. And when he came to the gate of the city, behold, a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, Please give me a little water in a jar that I may drink. And she was going to get it. He called, she, he called him and says, Please bring me some, a piece of bread in your hand. Now I want you to see something very powerful. You see, the situation is interesting here. But Elijah has become a different man coming out of Cherith. You'll see this in a moment. He's become a man who really knows God. He's really confident. The woman says, but she says, as the Lord lives, I have no bread, only a handful of flour and a little oil, and I'm going to gather the sticks and prepare a meal, and I'm going to die. And Elijah could have said like this, you're going to die? You're my provision. God sent me here to you. He sent me to this situation. He told me that if I come to you, you were going to feed me. What are you talking about? I just walked 17 miles. I crisscrossed in the nighttime to escape Ahab. I've come here. You're my provision. Don't you understand? And Elijah could have lived in his fear and said to God, God, what are you doing to your servant? Elijah did not. None of these things. Elijah instead spoke words of faith. Things that he had learned in Cherit. He now was going to use at Zarephath. And listen to what Elijah said to her. Do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make me a little bread cake. And afterwards, bring you make me for yourself and for your sons. Bring it to me. And verse 14 says, Thus says the Lord God, the bowl of flesh shall not be exhausted, nor the oil, until the rain comes. And so it was. Wow! And I can imagine that. I can imagine this woman standing there, looking at this man who's dusty, tired, and he's standing there in his clothes, and he's saying to her, Go do this. Go do this. The Lord has spoken to me. You know what's amazing about it? She listened to that man with confidence, who spoke with authority, and she just went and did it. That's amazing. That's powerful. And you know what? The reason why Elijah could do that is because he had learned his lessons in Sherit. You can't talk the talk until you walk the walk. Did you hear what I said? You can't light somebody else's fire until you, the fire in your own heart is burnt and you watch God prove himself faithful in charity. You can't give somebody else hope until you have watched the hope of God when your chariot was none and you watch God feeding you through the ravens and providing for you and you watch God in difficult situations. You can only help somebody when you've been through it. And Elijah had. And he'd watched God being faithful and because they'd watched God faithful, now he was going to go and bless a widow that he was supposed to, she was supposed to bless him, but he was going to bless her. Wow, that's amazing. Come on, that's amazing. And he says to the widow, go do it. And she says, yes, I don't know who you are, but, but I will do it. This is a man of God over here. And she goes, and I love this. You know, listen to what the Bible says, yeah? Just turn, turn to 1 Kings 17 again. I love this verse. In verse 5, God told Elijah to go to Cherith, right? And see what he says. So in verse 5, so he went and what? Did, according to the word of the Lord. Look at verse, uh, verse, verse uh, uh, 10. So he arose and went to Zarephath. When he was obedient, now he knew the effect of his own obedience. Now look, look at what happens in verse 15. So she went and did according to the word of Elijah. That's beautiful. You understand that? And she went. 
And when she went, she saw the miracle. What a miracle. That's fantastic. And what happens is she gets blessed. And then he goes and ministers to her son. And, and I want to close with a few thoughts tonight. Listen carefully. When it's all over, she says, I know that you are a man of God. And the word of the Lord is upon you. How did Elijah start? Elijah started as a, a young man, unknown, out in Tishbe. You don't hear much about him. But at the end of his life, when he has been through chariot, he now is a man of God. Three years in between, three years and a half of Bible school, his own kind of Bible school. But now he knows that God is with him and in, in every situation. I want to tell you something else interesting. The word Zarephath is a very interesting word too. Cherit means cut down. Zarephath means crucible. It means the place where you melt something and smelt something. Maybe in Zarephath, because most places were called Hebrew names based upon what was there, many scholars believe that there was possibly a smelting iron ore, a gold refinery there or something. And when the people in Zarephath, or when you had a gold refinery, you know what you did? You, you put the gold ore in, you know this, we've not thought it before, you put it in a big crucible, and you put the ore with, with whatever, and you heat the furnace up, and then when the scum and slag comes, you clear it from the top, and you keep doing that, you heat it up some more, and you clear the scum, and the, and the refiner sits at the end, at the, at the, at the, looking at the crucible, and he doesn't stop refining the process and putting the heat on and removing this process until he can see his own face in the liquid. And when he sees his own face in the liquid and his own reflection in the liquid, that's when he stops the fire. And this is a beautiful picture in Malachi 3, 1 and 2. God says, I am a refiner's fire and I will smelt you as gold and silver and will refine you as priests. And the picture is God puts us through Zarephath and he puts us through the trials and he puts us through the fire until his reflection is in us. And all that impurities deep down, far more than chariot, all those impurities that we become more like Jesus Christ in our speech and our actions and our thoughts, we're no longer impatient, we're no longer moody, we just begin to be changed by the, into the image of Jesus Christ. And when God sees that happening, He says, praise the Lord, I can stop the fire. And Zarephath was the crucible to test if Elijah had learned his lessons in chariot right. But I want to say something to you. God did it. When we go to the next chapters, we see Elijah on Mount Carmel. And we see him calling down fire from heaven. We see him praying and the rain comes. We see the man of God. But many times we don't look at the preparation that God had for him three and a half years before. And when you come to the place where the brook is dried up, just look ahead and say, God is not forsaken me. God has not forsaken me. I am in the palm of his hand. My picture is there, tattooed onto his hand. He looks at me every day. He is bringing me and training me. He is bringing me out of my self-sufficiency and my own ability and pride. He's bringing me out of my own rights He's bringing me to a place of dependency. He's teaching me to be a man of prayer. He's teaching me to be godly. He's answering my very own prayers. And when, when Cherith is over, he will move me. And there will be blessing. And then I will bring blessing to others that have to go through the brooks that run dry. Would you bow your heads and close your eyes? Father, we thank you 
for the preparation that is required to be men and women of God. Help us to remember before we go to Mount Carmel, before we are used in the greatest way in our ministries, in our lives, in our businesses, in our ministries, all roads must pass through charity. And all roads must pass through Zarephath. And help us to remember that you are there alive through it all. And help us to look forward to what you have in future for us. Because God, what you have for us is awesome. Help us to bring, reduce ourselves to nothing but Jesus. To want nothing but to represent him. This nation needs men and women who know the living God and represent it by their lives. Let's say Yahweh is my God. Thank you, Lord, today. There's somebody here today that's come with a lot of physical health problems. Lord, I want to pray for this lady. She's here because she trusts you. And the hands of Jesus are through the body. We pray for this woman tonight. We pray for the kidneys. We pray for her health. We pray, God, even the word of the Lord would touch her today. Encourage her. That you'd give her years and years of godly, wonderful life before you. That you would heal her body. Really heal her body, Lord. You're the God who can heal anything, any sickness, any disease, any organs. You can prolong life beyond. You may make us dependent on you, but that's a good thing. Lord, please bless this woman that I'll be praying for in time. In the name of Jesus. If you're here today, you've come to church, you don't know where you'd go if you died tonight. You said, Lord, I want to be in heaven one day. I want to give you an opportunity to believe in Christ, to trust in Him. If you want to go to heaven, you want to be sure of going to heaven. Say this prayer. Lord Jesus, I'm a sinner. I cannot save myself. Thank you for dying on the cross to pay for my sins. You were buried. You rose again. You're my Savior. Be my Lord. Forgive me my sins. Come into my life to live and change me. I want to be your child today. I ask in your name. Amen. Okay, let's stand. Let's worship the Lord. Okay, great. Amen.